Hello. Is it okay? Okay. Welcome. Uh, I think we're all set, right? So we, I see 302, a couple of minutes. Uh, welcome to the 10th cybersecurity lecture here at NYU Tandon. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I am uh, Ramesh Kari. Uh, I am a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at NYU. Uh, and I'm also a co-founder of the Center for Cybersecurity uh, with uh, Nasser and a few others. Uh, CCS uh, was one of the first academic groups of its kind. Uh, it was formed to, because we recognized uh, that cybersecurity is much more than a technical challenge. Uh, and the only way to secure our digital world is to work together with researchers and educators in business government policy, psychology, and a few other fields. Only then we thought we could know how the digital bad guys think and stay ahead of them. So today, the researchers at NYU CCS are helping, for example, DARPA secure the energy grid. Uh, we're also blazing and leading the path to securing biochips, one of the most promising new diagnostics. Uh, our team has made breakthroughs in building hack-proof chips. And we are securing the notoriously porous global supply chain for the electronics so that the bad actors cannot counterfeit them or take control of our hardware. Uh, my fellow researchers on the software side uh, are helping law, enforce law enforcement traffic, uh, track human traffickers and ransomware perpetrators by tracking Bitcoin, for example. They are protecting the vulnerable software uploads to shield data in the cloud and in our automobiles. Uh, they're also thwarting shoulder surfing. Uh, and this is NASA's latest invention. Uh, comes as, for example, the lead for the Tandon Online. Uh, he and his team has found a way to quickly scale up the number of highly skilled technical experts, both in cybersecurity, computer science, and engineering in general. So that's a, a little bit of background on CCS. Uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you know these lectures always focus on current issues in security and privacy, especially as they affect New York. It is no surprise to any of us in this room that New Yorkers had to take the lead in cybersecurity. Remember, New York is the world's epicenter of the finance and media industries. Uh, New York City's Cyber Command protects about eight and a half million residents and 60 million visitors that visit us annually. When we protect New York City, we protect the economy of our nation and even the world because this city is the largest economic force in America. So during the panel discussion later this afternoon, we will hear from lead New York's vital sectors, people who have been at the forefront of information security for a few decades. But first, we'll hear from our distinguished lecturer, Dimitri Alperovich. Uh, Dimitri and his team are widely acknowledged for first exposing the intellectual property theft by nation state hackers who have targeted defense contractors, the government, the oil and gas industry, Google, among others. More recently, Dimitri uh, and his team were contacted by the Democratic National Committee when they noticed that something was very wrong. The company he co-founded, CrowdStrike, discovered Russian hackers, booted them out, and protected the network. In a few minutes, Dimitri will share strategic measures he formulated while protecting industry and government from nation state hackers and everyday criminals. I won't take up too much more of your time, but first, I want to introduce Garen Pace of AIG. Uh, Garen leads 
AIG's cyber protection for its financial lines and property products throughout the world. He is at the forefront of a particularly difficult business challenge, which is made much more difficult by the explosion in the number of interconnected devices. Every day, he and his team at AIG must assess real risk for underwriting, and they must develop processes for AIG clients to thwart this emerging cyber risk. Uh, I want to thank, on behalf of CCS, uh, AIG for once again sponsoring this cyber lecture, and I ask Gan to join me on stage. embedded not just uh, in information technology, but it's uh, interwoven in our lives going forward. Uh, it's a big problem going forward uh, to manage this risk, and it needs, I'm encouraged by Ramesh's remarks, that it needs cooperation from academia, uh, technologists, uh, and of course practitioners themselves. So it's encouraging to see uh, a room like this full of faces to um, do more understand this risk. AIG is thrilled to, to sponsor a forum like this, and I'm very uh, anxious to hear Dimitri's remarks and then uh, hopefully foster a, a great discussion with the panel. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back and um, hope for a good discussion. Thank you. Further ado, Dimitri could, uh, uh, will come and give us the presentation. All right, we figured out the order. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Tandon. Um, thank you, AIG, for um, supporting this wonderful lecture series. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for um, over two decades now. And uh, I'm here to tell you that everything you know about cybersecurity is wrong. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel, actually, discussion afterwards um, to have a vigorous uh, debate uh, with some of the incredible professionals that we have from New York Cyber Command, from the financial industry, from cyber insurance industry, uh, about what I'm about to, um, to say. Uh, but my experience is based on um, two decades of fighting various adversaries. When I actually look at the cybersecurity industry, I break it down into three phases of conflict. So the first phase um, of conflict um, started in the mid um, um, or early 1980s um, and primarily consisted of two threat actors. It was Russia, Soviet Union at the time, and the United States, who were really using cyber for the purposes of espionage. They were breaking into each other's national security systems, military networks, trying to steal each other's secrets, really taking traditional espionage and bringing it into the digital realm in order to um, unleash what um, uh, General Michael Hayden, uh, the former director of the NSA and later the CIA, has called the golden age of signal intelligence. Because signal intelligence, a field that evolved um, at the turn of the last century, um, was at the beginning of the last century, um, was really all about passive collection. You were listening to radio waves, you were trying to intercept communications, you were trying to break cryptography. Obviously, uh, most of you have probably heard about Enigma and the incredible efforts of Bletchley Park in the UK uh, 
um, to break the, um, um, the German codes during World War II and the effect that it had in World War II. So that was signal intelligence throughout the, the um, uh, 19th century until really the 1980s where it was brought into this world of cyber where you no longer had to passively listen. You can actually be active and break into networks and steal information that was never going to be communicated. You can actually read documents and emails before they were even sent and um, gain access to information that would otherwise never be possible. And that's why uh, John Michael Hayden has called it the golden age of signal intelligence. But that was the first phase that ran through about the late to, uh, 1990s. Um, and at, at the um, uh, turn of the century, we saw the second phase of conflict where suddenly you had private sector actors, uh, criminal groups, as well as nation states realizing, um, other nation states realizing that this was really an incredible opportunity. So that's when you really started to see the emergence of botnets and all types of cyber criminal activities where people started to monetize the information that they were stealing, initially from financial sector, consumers, and others, um, and now uh, has created a, a very large and booming, um, obviously, illegal industry. At the same time, you had other nation states um, like China, North Korea, Iran, and others realizing that this was also a great way to collect in, uh, intelligence, but not just collect intelligence for the purpose of national security, but what China really started pioneering is the theft of intellectual property, breaking into private sector companies, stealing their trade secrets, stealing their intellectual property in order to benefit um, their own private sector. Um, and that kind of defined that second phase of conflict which ran from 2000 to um, early 2010s. And the third phase of conflict, which we're in now, really incorporates not just theft of information, not just espionage, but destructive attacks. Uh, we saw one just um, um, earlier this week in Atlanta that shut down most of the uh, city's um, um, departments. Uh, we, we had seen other states and um, companies and organizations all over the world being targeted by nation state actors, by criminal groups, not for the purposes of theft, but for the purposes of taking down their network either holding a hostage and asking for a ransom, or actually being vindictive and, and taking it down. So that's the phase we're in now. And when I look at that history, and um, having been involved in numerous investigations into all types of activity, both criminal attacks as well as nation state attacks, I've kind of put together these top 10 myths that people often talk about when they mention cybersecurity, but the, the myths are actually not true when you start digging into the reality of what we, we see. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, so I started CrowdStrike about seven years ago. Prior to that, I was uh, in a number of large cybersecurity companies. Before that, um, also a number of startups. Um, during the course of my career, I also had an opportunity to work with the um, US government on law enforcement investigations trying to bring criminals to justice, also worked for the, um, as an advisor to the Department of Defense on cyber policy issues. So um, have seen it from both the private sector as well as the government side in the course of my career. All right, so let's dive in. Myth number one, attribution is impossible in cyberspace. Um, I still hear this every once in a while, particularly from people who have never done attribution but uh, want to express an opinion on how difficult it is. And um, this is something that, um, ironically actually often comes from the, um, um, from, from the folks that are actually very, very technical because they're so immersed in the technology. They're so thinking about all the ways that you can possibly do false flag operations, all the ways that would make it very, very difficult to trace the attack back to the original host from which it was launched that they're not thinking about the bigger picture. They're not appreciating that this is an intelligence game. And there are many, many ways that you can do attribution that have absolutely nothing to do with technical means. Right? When you consider the government, when you consider uh, an intelligence service like the NSA or the CIA, they may not need to have any information about the technical details of the attack if they have a source in the foreign government that actually told them that this attack was being launched, or if they're in their networks watching them do it, or if they're seeing communications from um, the head of another country ordering his intelligence agency to execute that attack, right? So outside of the technical forensic details of the attack, you can have all types of information that can give you um, intelligence about what actually is going on. But the other thing that most people don't realize is that cyber is actually not that different from the physical world. So when you think about physical world attacks, right, when you think about bank robberies, we don't say that unless you can track the 
tire marks from the getaway car of a bank robbery back to the house of the bank robber, there's absolutely no way that we can find out who robbed the bank. Right? Obviously, that is not the way we catch bank robbers. What happens when you have a bank robbery is the FBI arrives, it conducts forensics at the investigation, it sweeps the crime scene for DNA, fingerprints, it looks at, is this an attack similar to other attacks we have previously seen? Right? Because bank robbers, just like cybersecurity um, groups, uh, or cybercrime or cyber nation state groups, as it turns out, tend to fall into the same patterns of activity. Once something works, we humans want to repeat it again and again and again. And that's what usually trips us up, because eventually you make a mistake, and also you uh, provide clues to the investigators about who might be behind this. So if you remember, um, I know this is a young audience, but there was a movie in the early 90s, Point Break, uh, with Keanu Reeves. A few of you remember, they just made an awful remake of it. Um, but um, um, in that movie, you had Keanu Reeves arrive on a scene of a bank robbery, and immediately he knew that it was the surfer gang that robbed the bank, right? Knew that right off the bat. Why did he know it? Because he looked at how they were executing the attack, how, off, uh, how long it took them to get into the vault, the fact that they were wearing masks of presidents and all the other things that they were doing, he knew that he was dealing with the same group. He didn't yet know who it was, but he knew that this was the same pattern, the same MO that uh, he had encountered in prior investigations. The exact same thing happens during the course of cybersecurity um, investigations. When you arrive on a scene of a crime, you look at forensics, you look at what actually happened, what tools were used, what techniques, how did they get in, how did they hide themselves, how did they bury themselves deep into the system, how did they get the data out, how did they clean up after themselves, how did they try to stay un unnoticed within the organization. All of those things you tend to repeat over time um, and is usually the first clue that gi gives you an idea of what might be um, what group might be responsible for this attack. Now, this can be faked, um, so you can't rely just on that, but usually when you look at the totality of evidence, not just one IP address or one uh, malicious software um, uh, file or um, one particular technique, but when you look at lots of different indicators of what is actually going on, you start to appreciate and grow confidence in what you're looking at. The other big thing that, that is actually very helpful in conducting attribution is victimology, particularly when you're dealing with nation states. They don't build a capability when they invest billions of dollars into offensive tools, into training personnel, hiring thousands of people. They don't do that to conduct one attack. Once they build that capability, they'll use that again and again and again, usually at a tempo of hundreds of operations every single week. And guess what? Because they're nation states, they're doing these investigations to further the interests of their country, which may be commercial interests or national security interests. But when you start looking at the breadth and scope of their attacks, you start to get an idea of who this might be. So for example, if you're seeing attacks all over South China Sea, Indonesia, Vietnam, Japan, South Korea, Philippines, Malaysia, but no attacks in China, you probably don't think that it's Brazil that's responsible for this, right? So that gives you a first clue. It doesn't mean that this is um, uh, absolute proof that um, China might be responsible, but it starts pointing you in the right direction. You start looking at other things. You start looking at um, the language um, on, uh, of the system on which the, the malware was compiled. Again, can be faked, but can provide a clue. You start looking at the working hours. Are they working during normal business hours uh, in a particular time zone? Are they off on particular national holidays? Again, not foolproof. Some of these nation states can run 24-7 operations and people can work the night shifts, but again, when you start looking at the totality of evidence, you start to appreciate what actually is happening here. The f fact of the matter is that attribution is actually not a new thing in cybersecurity. We're doing it more routinely, we're doing it more publicly. Uh, but the gentleman you see on the screen uh, with me um, is the original person who's done the first ever, um, as far as we know, um, cyber attack attribution. His name is Cliff Stoll, and he wrote an incredible book that I recommend to everyone. It's kind of a Bible in information security called The Cuckoo's Egg. So Cliff, uh, we had a pleasure of hosting him last year um, at our conference um, in San Diego, and he was the most impressive speaker I've ever seen. But he was a system administrator at Berkeley Labs in the 1980s when he discovered a discrepancy in the accounting system of his uh, Unix um, system that he was administrating 
which was supposed to charge every department for the use of that Unix system. So at the time, they were sharing systems, and any time you logged in and used resources on that computer, it was going to bill that department for the usage and the time that you spent um, using, on that machine, using that machine. And he found that the usage didn't actually align with the billing um, uh, that they were charging for those departments. And he started investigating and actually found a vulnerability that was being exploited in that application and found an intruder. Uh, and didn't just find an intruder. One of the things he decided to do, even though he was discouraged by virtually everyone from the government to his own boss to um, Department of Energy that, was, um, uh, that gave him the grant um, to do the work uh, from doing this, but he decided to track down the hacker. And over the course of a year and a half, this was at the time 1980s, nothing existed. He had to invent honeypots. He had to invent forensic technologies. He invented the intrusion detection systems. All the stuff that we now leverage today was actually him trying to figure out how to catch this hacker. And he managed over the course of a year and a half to actually trace it to a couple of teenagers in Hamburg, Germany, who once they were arrested, were arrested um, uh, we realized were working for the Stasi at the time, the East German Intelligence Service, and were breaking through Berkeley Labs to get into military networks of the US government on behalf of the Warsaw Pact um, and the Soviet Union. So, one of the first very early uh, cases of attribution where one guy single-handedly was able to perform it. Um, and since then, we've been doing it routinely. Every single attack that we have seen of consequence over the last 20 years has been attributed. Um, and now they're actually getting attributed more and more rapidly. So you're starting to see when the attacks come out, even the US government now coming out and saying we know exactly who did it. So when WannaCry, one of the big worm outbreaks uh, came out last year. Uh, within a few months, the US government said this was North Korea, and they had high confidence in that. A month later, another attack, not Petya, um, very, very destructive. In fact, the White House called it the most destructive attack in history. Again, they came out and attributed it to Russia. So we're getting much, much better at doing this because we have a long history of looking at these attacks and understanding um, the full scope of different operations of different nation states. And frankly, from the US intelligence community perspective, they're also getting better at penetrating their operations and watching them as they're doing these, these, these types of attacks. All right, so let's move to myth number two. I hear this all the time, even to this day. I meet with a company, uh, a major security person of a, oftentimes even Fortune 500 company, and they'll tell me, you know what? We don't care that much about cybersecurity. We have nothing worth valuable to steal. We make you know, soft drinks. We make this, we make that. And um, every single time, I'm just looking at them incredulously saying, why are you in business? If you have nothing of value that no one could ever possibly want, then what value are you actually creating as a company? The reality is, of course, that everyone has been targeted. When you look at the ransomware attacks that we're seeing, every single person, every single company that has valuable data that they don't want to lose will pay a ransom to retrieve that information and to, um, and to recover their, uh, their networks. We actually had the opportunity last year to work with a number of companies that were hit by the NotPetya attacks. They were completely destroyed. Um, I can tell you we arrived on a scene on one of these companies the day after. We couldn't get in the door because the badging system didn't work. The security systems around the video cameras around the building didn't work. Email was down. Phones were down because there were, there were voice over IP phones. The company was completely decimated. It was a public company, a major public company. We worked with actually a number of them that had the same effect. So the board of directors at that point was literally asking us, how much money can we pay to whoever is doing this to get ourselves back up? Because we can't service customers. We can't do anything. Um, really, really devastating impact to business operations of this major firm. And of course, the reality was it wasn't a ransomware attack. It was an attack by a nation state designed to actually destroy the network. Um, it wasn't targeted at that company. It was actually targeted at Ukraine. Uh, but it got out and spread um, across the world in a very untargeted way. Uh, but the reality is that when you look at cyber criminals, they will want something from you. They may want a ransom. They may want your intellectual property that they can provide um, to, their own, um, com to your competitors and others. Um, so there's always something that someone will likely want from you um, that's of value. Myth number three, I, I hear this one a lot as well. It's all about critical infrastructure. We hear a lot from the government. 
we need to protect critical infrastructure. The reality is that attacks on critical infrastructure, destructive attacks, are actually extremely rare. It's actually fairly difficult to blow things up in cyber. Uh, we've only seen a few cases where that happens. Um, oftentimes, people will refer to Stuxnet or they'll refer to um, the attacks by Russia on the Ukrainian energy grid. And the reality is that if you look, for example, at the energy grid uh, attacks in Ukraine, within three hours, the Ukrainians got into their cars, drove to the substations, flipped the switches on the breakers, and they were back up and running. When you look at Stuxnet, um, it was really um, uh, an attack that managed to delay the Iranian nuclear program uh, by sabotaging those centrifuges, but most, uh, by most estimates, the delay was only eight months. So there's a limit to what you can do from a prolonged effect perspective and from a physical destructive perspective in cyber, but cyber is an incredible tool for conducting espionage, for c uh, conducting coercion, um, obviously for doing influence operations like we've seen over the last few years. Myth number four. This is still a favorite of, of most people. Uh, I can't tell you how many conferences I've been at where I want to beat my head up against the wall because people keep talking about how information sharing is the answer. Nothing wrong with information sharing. It's a great thing when people can share information. It's not going to solve our problems, and I'll tell you why. There are two types of companies out there. There are companies that are the big financials, like ones that Omkar works for, um, that um, are happy to share information, but the reality is they already have most of the information that the U.S. government could possibly give them uh, because they already had it for many, many months that they've gotten from uh, companies like us and others that they work with as, uh, alongside their sector and they can leverage that very, very effectively. So the fact of the matter is very rarely do they actually need the government to come in and help them and provide them some secret piece of information that they didn't have. It doesn't happen. Second uh, type of company, which is actually the vast majority of them out there, is you can give them all the information you want, they wouldn't know what to do with it. You can give them IP addresses, you can give them domains. They don't have any systems to plug them into. So what good is it? Um, so the reality is that most people are actually not prepared to use the information that you could give them because they don't have the basic technologies that are, that are needed to actually investigate um, whether they have that threat or not on their network or what to do about it. Myth number five. Got a little cut off, cut off there. Cyber tool proliferation. I had a debate um, with a gentleman by the name of Ralph Langer, um, who's a brilliant uh, uh, security guy um, that does a lot in the area of ICS, industrial control systems, it was, one, was one of the early guys looking at the Stuxnet attack and figuring out what it was doing. And we had a debate right after Stuxnet in, um, I believe it was 2010 or 2011, where he was arguing that this was going to be the end of everything. Now that Stuxnet is out there, we have this blueprint. We're going to have factories being destroyed left and right, you know, nuclear power plants, enrichment facilities. All of that is just going to go up in, in smoke. I was arguing the other position. Um, I'll let you be the judge of who proved out to be right. But um, the reality is that it's actually not that, that, that uh, easy to copy um, both code as well as um, uh, copy tradecraft of operations. When you look particularly at ICS, most of these attacks are so custom. When you look at Stuxnet, it was targeting a specific type of centrifuge in a particular cascade with a particular drive motor with a particular software package. None of that actually is applicable to any other factory on the planet because it was targeted at the one enrichment facility. And by the way, when you are trying to do an attack against an ICS system, it's just like any software engineering exercise. You've got to test it. To test it, you need the hardware. So if you're trying to attack the Ukrainian energy grid, you better have the um, hardware that is deployed there so you can make sure that, that your attack actually works. Because if any of your computer science students, you know that the code that you first write will never work right out of the gate, right? You need to do lots and lots of testing, particularly when you're dealing with physical effect systems that are extremely complicated. You will never get it right on the first try. So that's why it actually is a lot more complicated than, than you think to say, wow, I see Stuxnet, let me use that against something else. Also, when you look at offensive operations, they're a lot harder than you think. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in a few minutes, but the reality is there is a reason why NSA or China or Russia 
and others are spending billions of dollars on this. If it was easy and you can do it on a shoestring budget, believe me, they would. Um, but they're hiring thousands of people and spending billions of dollars on these uh, capabilities. Myth number six, that we can solve this problem. The reality is that unlike virtually any other area of science, this is the one problem that will stay with us as long as there are people out there that are willing to do us harm. This is not like solving cancer or some other scientific problem where you could potentially at the end of the day come up with a solution, pat yourself on the back and call it a day. You're dealing with a sentient adversary that is looking at everything you're doing and is gonna sit there and say, how can I beat that? How can I get around that? What are the countermeasures that I'm gonna um, use in response to the uh, capabilities that um, uh, this defender is uh, exploiting? And that's what makes it so different from virtually every other area. That as long as you have that adversary that is motivated to do something bad to you or your company, they're gonna find a way or will, sometimes involving cyber, sometimes uh, combining cyber with human operations. One of the things that we're seeing now is actually intelligence services realizing that you can bribe someone to gain access and then use a cyber operation to, to uh, execute the rest of the attack. So you have to think about that from their perspective of not doing the hack. They couldn't care less about the hack. They're doing the operation to achieve a specific objective, whether it's steal, uh, stealing a specific piece of data or um, executing a destructive attack, a coercive attack, or information operations campaign, whatever it may be. And they're gonna use all tools in their power, including cyber, to achieve that objective. I alluded to this earlier, this myth that offense is easy. It's actually really, really hard. If any of you have ever done pen testing, man, is it hard. When you encounter systems out there, even if they're vulnerable, you have to adjust your exploit co code to work on that particular operating system, on that particular application, make sure that it doesn't conflict with anything else that's on the system. To execute flawless attacks, not that in the real world, not that easy at all. Yes, you can get someone to click on a link and give you their password, but that's not the end of the attack, right? You actually have to go in and execute the operations. You have to deal with their weird network configurations. You have to figure out where things are. One of the reasons it actually takes a while for, um, for uh, these um, operatives to actually execute their attack is because once they get in, they have no idea where anything is. Just put yourself in their shoes. Right? You start here at Tandon, or you start at a company, and you get a laptop, and you have to find where all the resources are. Where, you know, in a company, where's the HR database? How do I do my benefits? Where, where's, um, um, how do I get to my email? Everything that you have to figure out, and you have someone helping you usually, or you can ask uh, for help from your IT system. An adversary doesn't have any of that advantage. They landed on the network, on a machine of someone that they managed to perhaps social engineer or find a vulnerability, now they have to figure out what privileges do they have? What systems can they access? Where's the valuable data? All that takes time, incredible effort, and um, a lot of time. And now imagine doing this day in and day out against numerous targets all over the world where you're encountering systems with um, uh, documents in different languages from the one you speak. It, it is actually a complex thing. So that is why you have thousands of people working on this who are not just computer scientists, who are not just operators, they're linguists, they're people that uh, understand human nature, they're people that are doing human operations, they're people that um, are able to take in the intelligence that you steal, quickly process it, figure out where else to go, what else you need um, that gives you the missing ingredients. It is not something that, at scale, you're able to do with a few people on a shoestring budget. You need a big operation, and that's why you're seeing these um, attacks being conducted by intelligence agencies, by armed services with hundreds if not thousands of people in these units. This is another one that I see all the time. My God, cyber moves at a speed of light. What are we gonna do? Well, yes, it's true that in fiber optics cables, packets move at a speed of light, but I have never seen a human being type at a speed of light or, or execute any command at a speed of light. And the reality is that this is a human problem you are dealing with a human operative on the other end that is trying to do something to you. We actually did um, a profile of about 25,000 breaches that we stopped last year at CrowdStrike with companies all over the world. And what we realized is that what we call the breakout time, the time that it takes for an attacker 
to break out of the one system that they managed to get into by social engineering it. So they sent an email to someone, they clicked on it, they managed to um, uh, execute code on their system. Now they've established that beachhead, but that system is probably not the actual system they want. They need to get into the network, they need to get to the Active Directory server, they need to get to the SharePoint server, they need to get to all these things to, uh, that actually contain the valuable information. And the time that it takes them to break out of that beachhead was actually an hour and 58 minutes, almost two hours. And that is the time that the defender actually has to contain them at that location, to stop them at that beachhead and, and prevent the breach from taking, uh, taking place. That's not speed of light. It's not a lot of time, uh, but two hours actually, if you have 24 seven operations, if you have people that can respond quickly and rapidly in investigating that threat and determine what to do, it allows you to be efficient and mitigate virtually any breach that comes your way. And that leads me to myth number nine, which is this theory that cybersecurity is all about preventing everything. It's, it's about keeping the bad actors out. The reality is you will never be able to do that. There will always be vulnerabilities that you don't know about, so-called zero days. There will always be people that will click on links. We actually do these tests oftentimes with companies where we'll come in and do a kind of fake spear phishing attack um, to a portion of the company and see how many people click, and usually a big percentage of the company clicks. Um, then you go to these people and you, you kind of try to educate, educate them on what to look for and what a bad phishing email looks like. And um, you come back a couple months later and you send the same email out. Guess what? Many of the same people click. You can literally send an email out saying this is malware, do not click. I guarantee you there will be someone <laughs> in the company, if it's large enough, that will click on it. So it's human nature, evolution in action. And uh, the reality is you, you'll never be able to stop it. The human um, is always the weakest chain in the loop. And as a result of that, you have to assume that someone is already inside. So cybersecurity really becomes all about speed of response. There's something called the OODA loop that some of you probably have heard about. It's a, it's a military concept that came out of the Air Force, um, a guy by the name of John Boyd, uh, Major Boyd, later Colonel Boyd, that came up with a theory that in air combat, in dogfight situations, you and the adversary, um, the pilot on the, other, on the other side, are going through the same decision cycle, four-stage decision cycle. Observe, orient, decide, act, hence OODA loop. What he said is basically, the first stage is observation. You're looking at, um, at the radar, you're looking out, uh, out of your plane, you're trying to figure out what else is out there, what kind of threats um, are you facing. The second stage is orienting uh, those observations to what you know about the environment. You're looking at the friend or foe system to determine is this an adversary. You're determining how many threats are out there. Then you decide what to do. Maybe it, it's one, uh, one of you against five other planes and you need to get out of there as soon as possible. You'll get shot, shut down. And then finally you take the action that you've decided to, to take. And then you go back to observation to see how the environment has changed. And the key observation that he's made is whoever gets through that loop faster is going to win. It is all about that speed of response and efficiency of decision cycle. And you and the adversary are doing the exact same thing. And if by the time uh, you're shooting, he's still thinking about what to do, well, you're going to blow him out of the sky. Cybersecurity benefits a lot from that model, from that theory, because again, you're facing the adversary that's going through the same decision cycle as you are. And if you're faster than them, you'll be able to identify them and kick them out of the network very, very rapidly. One of the things that I advise every organization to think about in terms of their cybersecurity is focusing on three metrics. And these are outcome-driven metrics that are easy to measure and actually achieve the goal of helping to understand how um, um, effective you are at protecting your organization. The first metric, time to detection. Detecting a threat that, that, that may be already in your network or as soon as it comes in. Second, once you've detected it, investigating, determine if it's real, figuring out what you're going to do about it. And the third piece is time to remediation or cleanup or rejection of the adversary from that network. The best companies in the world focus on one minute to detect, 10 minutes to investigate, one hour to eject or clean up. Um, and as you saw from the previous statistics, if it takes the adversary almost two hours to break out of that beachhead and spread um, laterally throughout the network, and you eject them within one hour, well, guess what? They're not going to get anywhere. So it's very, very effective 
at measuring your speed of both detection, investigation, and response. And also, you can test yourself against this. You can do regular pen tests, uh, have a fake adversary that's coming in to break into your company, and you're measuring how quickly you detect them, how quickly you investigate it, how quickly you take action. The last piece is always the hardest because that actually involves dealing with people, right? It involves going to business units and telling them, what is that machine? Can I take it offline? Can I kill this process? Am I going to impact business operations? That's where usually I see a lot of companies failing and often taking weeks, sometimes even months, before they can make the decision of doing something. Uh, all the while, the data is already going out the door and you've got a big problem on your hands. Last myth, it is all hopeless. The world's coming to an end. We're going to have uh, the energy grid going out down tomorrow. What are we going to do? The reality is that, as I mentioned earlier, offense is not easy. Uh, it's a lot harder than people think. Um, at scale, these attacks can be executed against numerous targets that are hardened, uh, that may have a, an ICS component only by a few nation states that are out there. And obviously, doing so would um, uh, very rapidly um, lead to a, to a conflict that escalates outside of cyber and gets into the physical domain. So they will think, uh, I believe, very hard about doing something like that. And at the end of the day, as we talked about, if you're fast, if you have full visibility across your network, if you've got 24-7 teams standing by, ready to respond, that are sharpened in terms of their skill set, in terms of their um, intelligence that they, they, they have on what the different adversaries are doing, you can get inside the adversary's OODA loop. You can be faster, and you can beat them every single time. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions and uh, the panel. How are we doing the questions? All right. Just stand up if you have a question. I can't really see the hands if they're going up. We'll bring you a mic. Okay. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Testing. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm David. I'm an undergraduate here. Thank you so much for talking. Uh, I was just wondering, can you elaborate a little bit more when you were saying that uh, the second type of company uh, can get information but doesn't have the technology needed to properly use that information? Like, is that some sort of pain in the industry? Or, uh, yeah, can you just elaborate more on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, when you look at our entire economy, right, yes, you have the Fortune 500 companies out there with billions of dollars in budgets and um, uh, lots of people on staff. But you also have, the majority of our economy is actually small businesses, right? You look at our defense industrial base, the, the defense contractors that are building our weapon systems. You typically would think about Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop Grumman. Yes, they're the big primes, uh, prime contractors. The reality is most of the work gets done by a mom and pop shop somewhere in I Iowa with five people working on some critical component of this new ship that we're building that don't just have uh, don't, don't just not have security people, they don't have IT people, right? It's someone's job on the site to set up the computer systems for them. So when you look at organizations like that, that are literally hundreds of thousands of them in, the, in, in our country, you can give them all the information you, you want. There's absolutely no way that they will know what to do with it. You can give them an IP address. If they don't have any logging in place, if they don't have anything that would actually allow you to search for that IP address to determine if you've ever seen it on your network. What good is that information? And that's the majority of companies out there. In fact, we, we see plenty of big companies that don't have that uh, um, uh, capability. I mean, I can't tell you how many billion dollar or more companies I've met that have like one guy in security. Um, it happens all the time, unfortunately. Omkar can attest to that. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes, so my question goes uh, in the direction of the timelines that you, that you specified for the detection, the remedies, and so on. 
So you mentioned it. You mentioned it would be a good idea to detect that there is an intrusion within one minute. And On average. Well, I find it kind of surprising because in many cases it may take actually months to realize that there was a breach, and there are many high-profile cases, like for example this target breach of post terminals. We actually don't know for months that something has happened. And some people actually are happy to be able to detect it at all. And nobody really thinks about real-time detection. So, for example, can, can you comment on the tools that people can use to, to make efficient detection in really, really short time frames? And what is the, what is the actual accuracy yep. of, of detecting real attacks? I'm not talking about pen testing, because pen testing follows known protocols. Okay. Yeah, I, I will actually tell you. You know, we respond to breaches all the time uh, from nation states, criminal groups. Literally, um, we have about um, two incidents every hour um, on average um, that we uh, we see across the world across all of our customers. And um, pen testers are actually usually the hardest because the reality is, again, put yourself in the shoes of, um, let's say, military intelligence professional at any agency. It doesn't matter if it's US or any others. First of all, think about who they are. Typically, it'll be a very young person um, coming just into the military, and, and they're telling them, you're going to be an offense operator today. Congratulations. Here's a script that you're going to execute. Right? These are not, you know, obviously, they have some very smart people, but usually the majority of them are following scripts. Um, you know, they go to a course for three months, and suddenly they're uh, you know, a great uh, cyber offense operator. The reality is when, when we see pen testers, these are actually the top of the line, you know, people that are building their own exploits or their own tools. Usually, you see all, all the major innovations come out of the security community and then gets, gets adapted um, by, um, by the, um, the criminals or nation states out there. So, um, you know, Meltdown Spectre is a great example of that. Uh, no one had seen them prior to uh, that attack being discovered, and many, many others like that. But um, uh, to your point, if it takes you months, you've already lost, right? All of your data is probably gone. If you're dealing with the destructive attacks, it's not going to take them months to take down your network. So you absolutely have to move left of boom. And the one thing that a lot of people fail at is that they focus on trying to detect the malware, right? Malware is just one stage of the attack. Yes, you should do your best at detecting it. But there's so many opportunities for you to move across the kill chain. You look at privilege escalation. You, move at la you look at lateral movement. You look at credential theft. Right? When you look at, for example, um, how would someone move from that beachhead to other parts of the system, they can't do that without credentials. They can't do that without passwords. There are only a few ways that you can actually steal passwords. Look for all those ways. Right? Um, and the best thing that you can do, and something that I encourage every organization to think about, is to hunt for the attacker. Not to sit patiently waiting for an alert to go off, but to actually get out and start looking for them. Pretend that you are them. If you were them, where would you be? What would you do? Right? And that's often the most effective way. The analogy I often use is, you know, if you're defending a physical building like this, yes, you can have a guard sitting outside waiting for the alarm to go off. Guess what? The first thing that the sophisticated burglar is going to do is disable the alarm so it never goes off. You need to get them out of that booth, into the building with a flashlight, looking around continuously and uh, trying to find them. And that's what gets you that very rapid response. You, it won't be always a minute, but on average, with a lot of these attacks, you can detect them very quickly because, again, they fall into patterns of activity. And there are certain things that they have to do to succeed that you can identify, particularly at that lateral movement stage. Yes. Good evening. Um, Staff Sergeant Reedy. Um, so my question is, when you mentioned hunting, I immediately stood up because I always have to ask, what is your favorite data sources for the hunt? And what are your favorite uh, particular hypotheses to go after? Great question. Um, so I'm biased because uh, we're ultimately an endpoint security company. So we love endpoint data. Um, you know, network data is good. But the problem with network data is that nowadays, most of the network communications are getting encrypted, uh, both legitimate and, and malicious. So your ability to peer into it is getting more and more limited. And then there's also a philosophical problem when you're looking at network traffic. What you're really doing, whether you're doing it in an automated fashion or manually, is you're trying to reconstruct what actually is happening at the endpoint by analyzing those packets. So my preference is always to go to the source and look at what actually is going on. So if you can profile everything that's happening on the CPU, 
every activity from an execution perspective, file system, network, and everything else, you can actually aggregate that data and start looking for patterns. You can start asking questions of the data, particularly at a global level where you're not just looking at one system, but you're starting to see for anomalies. Where is a program that's only running there and doing things that it's not doing anywhere else? All those sorts of things. And, and again, if you put yourself in the mind of an attacker, how would I do this? You know, one of the things that our team does all the time, because we have 24-7 hunting operations across um, uh, millions of machines out there, they say, you know, if I'm an attacker, let's say I already breached the network, how would I come back? How would I maintain access? Well, one way you may do that is through uh, remote desktop connections, right? You've stolen passwords, so you remote desktop back into the organization. So let me look across all those millions of machines we're hunting, how many of them have remote desktop connections going into them? And the answer may be at any given point in time, half a million. Way too many to look at. Obviously, most of them, uh, if not all, will be legitimate. So then you say, well, okay, if I'm an attacker, what would I do? Well, one of the things I'd probably do is I'd bring my own tools into that session, right, to do something that I need to accomplish. So let me see how many of those sessions actually have some executables written to disk um, brought into that system. And the answer may be 10,000, still way too many. So you say, well, how many of those executables are unique that I've never seen before? And the answer may be five, and then you say, okay, let me look at what's going on inside those five sessions and try to determine is it good or is it bad. Just one example of how you may hunt and think about this problem, right? Looking for the unknown and hunting, a lot of people confuse hunting because this is a term that came out of the intelligence community. They were truly hunting, but when it sort of got into the private sector, um, you had people saying, well, you know, we'll just look for an IP address and we'll call it hunting. That's not hunting, that's, uh, that's um, shooting fish in a barrel. Hunting is going out in the woods looking for an animal that you don't know where it is, you don't know perhaps even what it looks like, and trying to find that bear, right? And um, that's, that's what hunting is in cyber. How much time do we have? Can we keep going? Okay. Denial of service attack on the mic. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suzette. I'm a graduate cybersecurity student here at Tandon. My question for you is, what advice would you give to new cybersecurity professionals that um, get hired into companies which actually believe some or all of these myths? What can we do? Great question. Um, the first thing I'll tell you is what not to do. Do not go to your executives and say, if you give me X, money, resources, whatever it may be, I'll ensure we don't get hacked. These are the first people that will get hired when you inevitably do have an incident. Um, what you should do is start thinking about what are you gonna do in the event that something happens. Prepare yourself for that eventuality because the odds are, um, as AIG will tell you, you will have some sort of issue. And oftentimes, it's not the issue itself that um, creates big problems for an organization, it's how you handle it. It's how you respond, and not just respond technically, but responds from a crisis management perspective, from a communications perspective, um, coordination with um, Congress, if, if need be, regulators, etc. So prepare yourself for that. One of the things I advise every company to do is do a war game, do a tabletop exercise. Prepare your executive for what it feels like to be under these um, attacks. One of the things that most people don't appreciate until they go through it is that when you are in the midst of a crisis like this, or any other crisis for that matter, you are not gonna have perfect information. In fact, you may have incorrect information, but guess what? You're gonna have to make decisions based on that because you can't afford to wait two months until everything is perfectly known. You're gonna have to decide what you're gonna do at every step of, uh, of that incident. And um, getting them into that mindset, getting them prepared, walking them through the different scenarios of if you do this, here's what's gonna happen and uh, perhaps you don't want to do that, is extremely helpful for when you actually go through that incident that it becomes more of a muscle memory thing of, okay, I know who to call. I'm going to call my lawyers because everything that we do here I want under privilege in case I get sued, right? All those things that unless you, you exercise for it and, and think about it in advance, you're not going to be prepared for. So that's the number one advice I would have for you is start thinking and planning for the inevitable 
and then start thinking about how can I reduce that risk and what can I do to actually speed that up. Um, think about those metrics, highly encourage them. If you have um, others that uh, kind of measure that speed of response, which I think is really where this game is, um, would love to hear that. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Franklin. I'm a uh, cybersecurity student at Empower. Uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, GDPR and how that will affect the responsibility of cyber professionals going forward. So there are good and bad things about GDPR. Um, the problem with GDPR is that it's a privacy regulation that also is trying to be a cybersecurity regulation. And those two things are oftentimes in conflict with each other. Right? You can't do cybersecurity without collecting certain information, like IP addresses, for example, that in Europe can be considered personal identifiable information that GDPR tells you you should minimize your collection of. So that's sort of the bad thing about GDPR. The good thing about GDPR is it's actually is focusing on like prior regulations on cybersecurity and uh, creating actually potentially massive penalties for companies that get breached and don't report it in time and don't handle it appropriately. Um, under certain conditions, it can be as much as 4% of global revenue, which is material. So um, it is um, starting to encourage people to think about what to do. Um, and, and there are some good things, for, even from a privacy perspective, the focus on minimization, asking constantly, is this the data that I actually need? Do I need to keep it if I did, did need it originally? Those are actually very, very good things. Um, so you know, like any regulation, government regulation, uh, you know, you take the good with the bad. Um, but the good news is it's not very prescriptive, so it's mostly focused on outcomes. There are some prescriptive things that are not great in it. Uh, but that's what I love to see from regulations is focus on the outcome, let the private sector figure out how to get there, and penalize them if they don't do it right. Yes? You talked about the China uh, attacking and getting into electoral uh, property, right? Can you talk more about it, uh, be more sp uh, specific, like uh, uh, where do they attack, uh, what do they steal? Is it by individual or is it by government? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, U.S. government just did um, um, a number of actions against China in terms of raising um, tariffs, um, partly in response to the cyber attacks that the Chinese have been executing against um, Western companies for the last um, almost 18 years. And um, in terms of the targets, um, they can actually be taken straight out of the five-year plans that the Chinese um, Communist Party issues every five years. Um, so the industries that they consider strategic, um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's um, um, solar power, etc., those are the exact same industries where they are breaking in and trying to steal intellectual property and trying to build up domestic industries with that um, IP that they steal. Um, they also steal uh, trade secrets and negotiations. So we've seen a lot of attacks on the oil and gas sector, for example, where one of the things that they want to do is figure out how much different companies are bidding on particular um, properties um, where they would be drilling so that they could um, uh, come in and, um, and win those bids, uh, having that, uh, that prior knowledge. So, a lot of that activity happening. China really pioneered that uh, um, industrial cyber espionage at scale. Um, there are other companies, uh, companies, uh, other nation states that are doing the same, uh, but China is by far the, the worst offender in that particular area. Hello. Hi, we're yeah. here. My name is Avneet. I'm a cybersecurity analyst at NPower. My question is more companies today are moving, have decided to move to the cloud. And companies earlier were reluctant because they felt like it's not secure. So is that fear uh, founded? Like, is it true? Or what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I'm a huge believer in the cloud. We're a cloud company. Um, not just our technology is cloud based, but um, we're a fully cloud company as well, CrowdStrike itself. The reality is that um, th there is massive benefits of leveraging a resource um, like you know, Amazon or Google or Microsoft where they are seeing all these types of attacks against all of their customers and are able to leverage that to provide the best protection. Most companies, and, and I work a lot with all, all three of the organizations I've mentioned, most companies I meet have, will never have the level of security 
and the security talent and investments that those companies can make. So when you worry about the security of the cloud, the first thing you should ask yourself is, will my security on premise ever match what these guys are doing? And by, by the way, both physical security and cybersecurity, right? You know, Google, um, a company that's uh, an investor in CrowdStrike, full disclosure, when you look at their security team and when they have significant incident like the one they had eight years ago that I worked with them on, they mobilized literally the entire company, not just the security team, but given that they have a lot of engineers, they said, hey, all of you guys are going to help, right? Um, and that's something that very few organizations are actually capable of, particularly those that are not in technology, right? So um, you get tremendous amounts of benefit. Like anything else, you have to use it properly, right? So you, know, you can go and get uh, an S3 bucket on Amazon and make it world readable, and Amazon is not going to help you. Right, so you have to do basic hygiene and, and protection and audit, and again, assume that someone may be able to get in and hunt for them and constantly check what's going on. So just like anything else, but I think you get a lot of benefits and a lot of scale from leveraging the cloud. So last three questions. All right. One, two, and one up online. So Hi, uh, my name is Latoya Robinson. I'm also a cybersecurity uh, student at Empower, and uh, my question is. Uh, basically, so we have all these tools uh, tools around that rely on uh, algorithms and machine learning and AI. And that's one of, I guess, the bigger trends that are coming out now. And my question is that with um, all the good benefits that it has, do you see any vulnerabilities later on with the use of AI and people relying on it uh, for security and vulnerability management? Look, there is no sil silver bullet in cybersecurity. Um, we leverage machine learning and, uh, and uh, many others do as well. The reality is adversaries are doing machine learning, adversarial machine learning against us, right? So it, it is a constant cat and mouse game. Um, it has its place and, and it is actually very useful in analyzing lots of data and deriving um, intelligence from it. Um, I don't believe that in any foreseeable future it will replace humans. In fact, I think that cybersecurity will probably be the last industry to get um, uh, fully uh, automated. Uh, um, fully automated, um, primarily because you're dealing with the adversary on the other end that is constantly finding holes in what you're trying to do, and everything will always have holes. Who's next? Hi, uh, Sergey Sivtsov from uh, AIG, Enterprise Risk Management. Um, I have a follow-up question on this, actually. How do you see, maybe you can share your thoughts, on the evolution of myth number eight with the use of AI by the state-sponsored entities. So, sorry, I, I couldn't catch that, the use on what? So the myth number eight, where you said the, uh, the cyber threats, oh. or the cyber attacks moving with the speed of light. How do you see it evolving going forward with the use of AI by the state sponsors? Yeah, so, so here's where AI is useful. Where you have lots of different data that is too much for humans to sift through where a machine can make a decision that's good enough or sometimes even better than a human because there's just vast amounts of information. If you're looking at two pieces of data, don't use the AI, have a human look at it. It will be much more efficient and much more accurate um, than, um, than any artificial intelligence algorithm. So you have to think about it in those ter terms when it comes to offense, what are the adversaries doing that is at that scale where um, a machine will be more helpful than a human? And, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to what they actually do after the intrusion. When they sync, um, you know, terabytes of data out of, your, out of your network, someone has to sift through it and figure out what's useful, what's not. That's where, you know, automatic document classification and automatic translation systems and all those things come into play to help you figure this out. On the reconnaissance stage as well, where you, you want to figure out um, information about the people that you're trying to spearfish and find the relevant things that would trigger the right um, um, things for them to open up that email or click on that attachment. That's also where AI can help. There are other areas as well, but that's how you need to think about it, is where do I have lots of different data that I want to throw in an algorithm and have it make some decisions for me? Maybe just a quick follow on. What do you see the next big um, breach or the next big incident happening in what space? No, it probably just happened. We don't yet know about it. <laughs> Next so uh, there's one final question. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to uh, remind that there are lots of people who are, are watching this on live stream. 
and I got one, no, we got uh, one question. Uh, uh, one, uh, it's how important is hashtag security awareness to a uh, hashtag CTO? How many dollars and resources does a CTO put into a security aware, hashtag sec aware program? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lot of hashtags. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so look, I, th I think your investments in cybersecurity should be commensurate with the value of what you're trying to protect. Um, and the downsides to your business if you fail to protect it um, or if that data gets uh, destroyed or corrupted in some form or fashion. So you need to think about it in those terms, in terms of risk management. And um, it's going to be different for every company. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I often encounter when I have meetings with companies and they're thinking about doing this or that, um, the reality is when they have an incident, the wallet just opens up. No one ever asks for a price of a tourniquet, right? When they really need it, they're gonna spend all the money in the world, except that no one wants to spend it on front, up front. So it's a lot like insurance, unfortunately. So um, you, you have to start thinking about this, and this is why war games and tabletops are so important, is because you can show to your executives what the downside is. Um, you know, we did a major tabletop with a huge bank um, not that long ago. Um, this was a tabletop, so we didn't actually execute the attack, but in the course of the tabletop, we highlighted some major issues in the bank that would cause them to suspend all trading operations um, and actually lose full confidence in their data. And the top executive of the firm was in the room while we were doing this, this four-hour war game, and he said at the end of the war game, this better not happen in real life. What do we need to do? How much money do we need to spend? Because that would put us out of business, right? So. When you do these types of things, um, you know, budgets tend to come out of thin air and just materialize. So, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, there are usually three pieces to this uh, cyber lecture, every cyber lecture. We are done with the first part. Uh, the second part and the mo uh, very important aspect of it is uh, networking so we have about 20 minutes where you can uh, meet with each other outside there are a few drinks and uh, water and cookies and so on and we'll be back here at 4:30 for the panel so that's the third piece of this puzzle so thank you all and uh, we come come back in about 20 minutes ish roughly thank you yeah i was afraid i was saying too much <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> fan base. You got a fan club here. Mics are on now. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, I hope you had a good networking session. My name is Randy Milch, and I'm uh, honored to be the moderator of the second part of uh, the third part. I'm sorry. This is the third part of the uh, afternoon. Okay. Um, I'm. Get my phone out of the way. Maybe that is something. All right. I'm. It's getting better. Don't worry. <laughs> Dimitri, does CrowdStrike deal with this sort of thing too? Or? Uh, I wish. All right. All right. First of all, I'm just going to walk over here and, just, and talk loud. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 People online can't hear me, but you know, you don't come, you don't hear things. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank Dimitri again. Please give him another round. Of <laughs> and I want to um, uh, also uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Um, uh, who are going to be talking about the 10 myths. Uh, and are they myths or not? I think that's going to be one thing we're going to talk about. Um, but uh, in addition here, we, well, first we have Omkar uh, Arasevanam. How is that? Close. Close enough. <laughs> Please, say it. Please. Omkar Arasaratnam. Arasaratnam, thank you. I'm sorry. Omkar is what I would term a power player uh, in the cybersecurity world. He comes from the financial industry where he's had very senior uh, positions uh, in, in, the, in, in, in finance uh, in the cybersecurity realm. Um, he is uh, garden leap. We can talk about that if he wants to. Uh, between two very high-powered jobs, uh, and uh, he's going to bring the perspective this afternoon of someone who works in a in a field that is very highly regulated, has very important data. I'm not even close to. <laughs> has very important data uh, and also frequently has a lot of money to spend on the problem. All right, so that's an important perspective that I think that, that should, uh, <coughs> should think about. Um, next, we have uh, Kiesitz Phillips, who is the deputy uh, uh, cyber uh, CISO, deputy CISO of New York City Cyber Command. Um, she is the deputy for um, uh, threat uh, threat management. Uh, so she runs the SOC, she runs the CERT. She basically is the person when something happens in the city's dispersed information network, she's the woman who leads the team for response. Um, and so we're very happy to have her here today. And she's um, giving out her cell phone number after this, right? Don't sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and she's here for Jeff Brown, who is, uh, who is the CISO for the city, but he was caught up in the mayor's big announcement, who we will talk about. Because while you were here, it was a big announcement, a cybersecurity announcement made by Mayor de Blasio, but we will bring you up to date because that's the way we are here. There's all news all the time. <laughs> um, and finally, we have Darren Pace, who you met. Uh, he's from AIG. He is the person who is running AIG's uh, Cyber Insurance Book of Business. He's the one who's trying to make everyone feel safe because you've got cyber insurance. If anyone out there does not have cyber insurance, talk to Gary. He's got a product for you, and he's going to make sure that you feel comfortable and safe. Um, so this is our distinguished panel. We are going to have a bit of a conversation that I'm going to put forward at the beginning, uh, and then we are going to open it up to the, to the audience, uh, including the uh, online audience, if they can uh, hear me, uh, to discuss uh, various aspects of what we could have. You have this uh, live thing here with me. If you could try to use the mic again. <laughs> All right, maybe that's going to work. <laughs> Good. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's start off here. I think one of the very interesting myths that, uh, or several myths that Dimitri, you put forward was this, um, this the, you discussed the fact that there were two types of companies. Uh, there was the company uh, that um, already had all the threat information in the world, right? And then there were the companies that you could give them all the threat information in the world, they wouldn't know how to use it. Uh, and you all 
also then at the end talked about how don't worry, be happy. If you have 24 7 coverage, if you can detect in a minute and discern in 10 minutes and remediate within an hour, you're going to be fine. Most of the time. The, most of the time. Uh, okay. <laughs> but it seems like for a, a company that is too small or too high bound not to be able to even understand threat information, it seems very likely that that company is going to have 24 7 people can detect in a minute, discern in 10 minutes, and remediate in an hour, right? How do you deal with the fact, how should we deal with the fact that there is this huge divide between companies that can, at the very least, afford and deal with this information, like the company that Omar deals with, and there are many, many companies, right, who are not able to reach that. How do we get cybersecurity down market? That's a great question. I think you nailed the, the issue that we have from a nation perspective of how do we actually address this problem and how do we help the cyber have nots, if you will, um, that either don't have the resources, don't have the talent, don't have the capabilities to, to actually do something about it. And by the way, this is not just exclusive to small and medium businesses or even companies um, of larger size. Government agencies are a great example of this as well because yes, you have the intelligence community, yes, you have the Department of Defense with massive budgets and lots of people um, to throw at the problem. What do you do with the Census Bureau? What do you do with all these other departments in the US government? Or OPM was a great example as well, right? That have very valuable data but probably will never be able to hire the top people, will never have the biggest budgets to, um, to deal with this problem. So it is a huge issue, and um, that is why, you know, the, there was a question earlier during my talk about cloud. Cloud, I think, is a key answer to this because it allows you to offer capabilities at a much cheaper rate, prioritize it uh, for the broader population, and you can outsource a lot of that um, uh, security to another provider like CrowdStrike or others that can do it for you at an at a, um, affordable rate because you will never be able to hire the right people. So Garen, how would you deal with this problem? You're trying to sell insurance. Traditionally insurance had two roles. One is it spread the risk of, a, of, a, of, of, of something bad happening to the insurance companies and by that to the greater society. The other, however, was that it did underwriting. That is, it tried to reduce risk with the promise of a lower premium. How, would you, how do you see the, the marketplace across entities? In other words, when you go out and try to sell insurance, what do you see out there? Do you see this great disparity between the, the, the security haves and the security have-nots? Do you, and how can the insurance help to solve that problem? Uh, I, I, I absolutely do see a lot of companies who I, I think are don't have the awareness that fall into that, that, that camp of 90% who wouldn't know what to do with the information if they, if they had it. Um, I think there is a, an, well, we have a lot of awareness today. You know, you can't, you can't not see cyber in the news or hear about it, but I think more people need to, to think about it and execute it in a little better. I, I appreciate something Dimitri said, but I want to push back on it and, and, and highlight the problem. I, I absolutely believe that, he, you know, he's, he's right. Um, Cloud is not inherently bad, and there's a lot of good to come from cloud. But one of the challenges without that awareness, you know, uh, at AIG, where uh, I would say, Randy, we, we want to spread risk, and we want to underwrite, we also want to educate and raise best practices. So we've done a lot of work, and I've asked, you know, cloud companies, you know, you offer this security feature to your constituents. How many of them are using it? Well, less than a tenth, whether it's uh, they're not using strong authentication that the provider allows, uh, whether there are, there are checkup systems that, you know, email providers uh, say, make sure your, your email is conf or your cloud email is configured correctly. People aren't using them. Um, so I think we need more, not just awareness, um, but we need more education and, and, and more understanding of the risk. Uh, so I posit that that's one of the things that we need to do is not only, it's not just buying insurance, it's not just being aware and, and seeing the underwriting, which I think will also help in that education when we tell people this control you need because those threats are out there that Dimitri is finding and keeping us abreast of, but really converting that into an action. This is why this is important. 
um, take advantage of the good things that, for instance, cloud can provide. So, Kiesens, uh, we're talking. We were talking just a second ago about securing companies. So, could you tell us first what the New York City Cyber Command is briefly, and also the mayor just made an announcement about New York City Secure, which deals with the security of individuals, the citizens of New York. Can you describe what that is and, and uh, what, what, what that new initiative is for the audience who, who were here raptly attentive to Dimitri's speech and didn't <laughs> hear the announcement? Sure. So first off, your first question is, um, what is New York City Cyber Command? So last year, July 2017, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio signed an executive order that instantiated or brought to life New York City Cyber Command. Um, <clears throat> and our mission is to very simple, prevent, detect, uh, respond, and recover from cyber-related <coughs> threats for over 100 agencies within the city of New York. Um, with regards to NYC Secure, uh, this is basically two initiatives for the public, uh, which is trying to provide you a little bit more protection, uh, so give you safer Wi-Fi and uh, mobile protection. Uh, if you would like to get more information about that, I would urge you to visit uh, secure.nyc. There you'll be able to see the Wi-Fi initiative, which should protect you from any types of, uh, whenever you visit public Wi-Fi, uh, you'll get some extra protection. Let's say if something occurs on that network that shouldn't, uh, you'll be alerted about that. And from a mobile side, uh, you'll also be alerted to any types of threats that you encounter on your mobile device. And this is all keeping privacy in mind as well. So secure.nyc. So I'm, I'm interested in talking for a minute about how we uh, induce the entities in the country, the, both citizens and corporations, um, to have better cyber security. The, 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 you know, Dimitri, I'd be interested to know if this comports with your view, but I read the reports that come out every year about uh, the, la the last year's attacks, uh, and uh, repeatedly uh, it appears as though most attacks are actually very simple and many, in many instances good cyber hygiene, so a, sort of a lower level set of, of protective practices would, would, be a, would be of immense value uh, from a bang for the buck sort of perspective. First of all, does that comport with your view about the cyber hygiene, about cyber security generally? Uh, but I'm interested in in, in after that, what can we do to induce both citizens on their own part and companies to take better cyber precautions? Um, what, what kind of things can, can the society at large determine that they must do or should do? So Randy, the first part of your, um, your comment um, is spot on. Uh, the second part I vehemently disagree with. And uh, the reason is that, again, um, Say when, which is which. So that right. <laughs> so, so when you talk about um, you know the majority of attacks are simple. Yes, that's correct. The second part of if only we did you know hygiene, we would stop them all. That's where the problem lies because again you're dealing with an adversary that right now is using simple methods because that's all that it takes to succeed. But once you make it a little harder, they don't just say, well we're done here, we're out of business particularly think about a military agency. If general comes into your office and says, I need to get into that target, no is not an option, right, for those of you who have been in the military. So what do you do? You escalate. You bring in more advanced tools, more advanced techniques. You try other ways to get in. So it is a fallacy to say that if only we did X, Y, and Z, we'd stop 80% of the attacks because that assumes a static environment where the adversary just sits there and says, well, I'm going to pack up and go home. I'm done here. That never happens. So I'm not saying that hygiene is not good, but we should not be assuming that if only you do X, Y, and Z, you're good to go, because the adversary will always, always up so, their game. Uh, and every decision you make, you should be thinking about what is the enemy going to do, because they always have a move to play. So is fair there, enough. That's a, very, that's, a, that's a very good point. I guess the question would come down is if it solves 5% of the attacks and it's not very expensive, is it worthwhile doing? But let's. Let's talk about this from the standpoint, Omkar, of a very large organization with very valuable uh, data, mm -hmm. highly regulated. Mm -hmm. What, what I I is you in a position of authority to recommend issues and rec recommend solutions and the like, how much of your uh, viewpoint is colored by 
needing to check a regulatory box, and how much of your viewpoint is, is actually driven by what you think is the best cybersecurity for the, for the dollar, and do you think that the regulation distracts from your cybersecurity mission or adds to it? Uh, good question. So I think, you know, I started in cybersecurity back about 15 years ago when we called it information security or information assurance. Um, obviously not as uh, good in terms of branding, but cybersecurity mm -hmm. now. And at the time, I would say, if you told me 15 years later that I'd be on stage with an insurance guy, I'd tell you you're out of your mind. But I think what this demonstrates, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry I thought we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but in all seriousness, I think our industries, as we were discussing over lunch, are starting to converge. And where it's starting to converge is we need to collaborate a lot more because I need to understand when we think about risk, right, it's impact and likelihood, which is the same language that our friends in insurance use. Because if something is going to have maybe a once in 10 year occurrence, but blow me out of the water and be a billion dollars of damage, then I've got a different view as to whether, or as to how to solve that, and how much money to spend in solving that, versus something that might be a okay, this is going to happen five times a day, but cost you 10 bucks every time. It's going to be that mosquito in your ear. And a lot of the work that we need to do as an industry, um, again, as we were talking over lunch, if I go to an insurance company now, they can give me a quote for car insurance based on my car, zip code, and age. And they're going to make money off it and have a fair amount of assurance as to what their profit margin is over my lifetime. We're nowhere near that when it comes to cyber today. And one of the challenges we have, um, while many people perceive all of financial industry to have this you know, really deep pocket when it comes to spending, you know, not, not all banks are equal and some banks have cost constraints. And when your CTO comes in and says, okay, $5 million of your CTB is gone. Sorry, CTB changed the bank project budget. I need to be able to say, here's my rank ordered <coughs> list of risks. Here's my controls. Here's the efficacy of those controls. And look, Mr. or Miss CTO, if you cut five mil, I can only do these many things. If you give me 10 mil more, I can do these many things. And here's the impact. How do you feel about that? And I think that's where our, that's where our industry needs to go. In terms of regulation, I think it comes down to stages of maturity in the organization that you're in. If you are a less mature organization, you'll find that you're, you're, you're just never getting your head above water when it comes to emerging regulation because last year it was NY DFS 500, next year it's going to be another one, and as these regulations evolve, it'll feel like you're constantly going through this spin cycle. More mature organizations take that risk, control, efficacy, and use that as the Rosetta Stone, and then map regulatory requirements against it. If you look at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or if you look at Sarbanes-Oxley, they're not materially telling you the manner in which you need to manage. A powerful ID is different. You need to be able to solve for the high watermark and then use that as proof against all the other regulators. So in that sense, it's in that sense for a mature organization, uh, the regulation is, is simply a, a byproduct of the, not a byproduct, something has to be paid attention to, but not a driver of your, of, your, of, your, of your behavior. Not if you're doing it in a mature manner, and I'd also say some of this has to do with the regulator's maturity as well. When Dimitri was mentioning you know, things like GDPR where most of it, and I agree with you there's some opportunity for improvement, most of it's outcome-based. If you have a regulator coming in and prescriptively telling you, you have to use this cipher and TLS version three and, 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 they're way in the weeds, and that's not a place you want to be. And typically, regulators will only give you that kind of um, extremely specific, direct direction if they find you're not managing your business properly. If you're managing your business, and back to the, the columns, right? You can say, Mr. Regulator and Miss Regulator, here's my risks, here's my controls, here's my efficacy, and this is my risk tolerance for how I'm managing that. That's mostly what regulators are looking to see in this space these days. And so 
I guess I want to bridge the gap here. Mm -hmm. you, you, you talk a really precise game about uh, you know, uh, risk factors, uh, controls, and efficacy. Uh, same sort of language that you say the insurance company would love to do, yet you say the insurance company can't possibly have enough information to do that. How can you have enough information to do it? Oh, we don't. <laughs> we don't. And um, a lot of this, I would love to take an academic approach and say there's a 38.9% chance that the moment that I allow BYOD, bring your own device access at work, that somebody's going to go to this site and get this kind of an infection. Therefore, we should deploy CrowdStrike everywhere or something like that. But, but we should not do that anyway. <laughs> we should do that anyway. Thanks, Dimitri. Well, uh, Randy, if, if I may, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned, the insurance industry has always been an, um, a promoter of best practices. And today, when you buy property insurance, uh, if you're a sophisticated company with a, a, a lot of insured assets, a lot of value, uh, that typically involves an engineering assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and over the years, you know, the gold standard, there's a gold standard insurance company who says this is what protection looks like. And they actually define that. A lot of companies strive for that level of protection to, uh, to show best practices and, and risk management around their property. Um, what I th believe, and I think what, AI, what AI, I know what AIG believes, is that we need to get to that level of education and best practices and reward in the cyber insurance market. I think that there's more under it needs to be done. And while there's no model is perfect, um, I think that more data collection around the types of losses that, that people have, the types of industries they're in, the type of control postures they have, um, will help drive more of that data and more of that math that Omkar wants. So he can say, in a particular industry, these are the threats they are focusing. And this is kind of the the control environment, which seems to, I hope Dimitri will say, at least get us above you know, the, 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 the cyber poverty line. I, I appreciate that those nation state attackers, just because you deny them you know, strong, you know, single factor passwords, they're not, they're not gonna stop. But there, there definitely seems to me to be a poverty line of, we gotta raise the total cost to the adversary. And I think that there are some places that we can show with data um, where the cost to the, the defender is, is much less than what we, what we do to the adversary. And we, we hope to be able to provide that. Yeah, and you know, the, the three metrics that I talked about in my presentation, time to detect, time to investigate and remediate, um, they're actually, I find, is a good framework for determining the efficacy of the various controls or um, investments in people, and et cetera, because you can go to your board and you can say, I need $2 million for XYZ solution, and then next quarter, the board can say, well, how did those metrics change, right? Did they improve? And if they didn't, you just wasted potentially $2 million, right? So that's a good way to also judge on an outcome-driven basis, is it improving things? So back to your question about hygiene, not saying hygiene isn't great, but you should think about that. Is, is it gonna make me more efficient at detecting, investigating, and responding to attacks? And chances are it will be, because it will allow you to focus on what's really important and allow you to stop all that other nonsense that comes in at you every single minute that you don't have to deal with. So I'm not saying it's not important, you just, you have to keep it in mind that it may not necessarily stop the, the persistent actors. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that we need. Sir, sorry. Would I was just going to add a point because I think there's so many other metrics, I think those are great, but there's so many other metrics that can be gleaned from the data that we do have. Now an insurance company, being that you're not looking inside of other companies, which you may be insuring, might not have an onslaught of a whole bunch of data to be able to pump into your algorithms and make these calculations. But to your point, you're saying that you don't have the data, but you do. Um, like there's a treasure trove of data that we see all the time and that we can be learning from um, to see like how valuable we are, how fast you're detecting things, how fast you're responding. Um, even before that, you know, what signatures are actually providing me value if you're using signatures. If you're going more behavioral model, you know, how fast or how likely is it to detect something in my environment. So there's other things that we could be doing to feed, you know, our resource count, um, to feed, you know, how valuable the stuff that we have currently is valuable or effective in our environment versus, you know, what they tell us it will do. Um, so I just think we need to really capitalize and take advantage of what we do have and try to draw those corollaries 
within our own environment. I think, the, I think the other place that we as an industry um, need to have a lot more transparency, and it just comes down to being a good engineer, right? Blameless root cause. We all need to be able to gather around the table and say, where did this break? Why did this break? Without fear of legal or other repercussions or accusations of negligence in order to be able to get at the real problem, right? Because too often, especially in corporate IT, for those of us that have worked in incident response with some of my friends uh, sitting in the audience over there. It's a detect, okay, re-image the box. Whoa, whoa, root cause, why did that happen? Let's walk it back. What control failed? Why didn't we expect to see that? How are we going to ensure that doesn't happen again? Does that fit with our prediction model? Did we think it was gonna happen with this frequency? We need to be a lot more inquisitive about why things happen versus being good IT people and just making sure we're back up and available. I wanted to, Randy, if I may, um, expound on one thing. Uh, the way, and I'm curious what Ankur thinks of this, the CISOs go to the board. You know, the <coughs> metrics need to map back to the universal language of, of, of dollars. Um, this is a, I'm, I'm positing this, I'd push back on it, but I think it's very hard to go to the board and say, well, uh, this thread is trending up, we're gonna, we're gonna upgrade this to, you know, chartreuse or whatever the color is of the day. Yeah. Um, we need, you know, that's not how a, a CFO goes into, into the room and talks and says, I need this investment, uh, this is our cash flow position, uh, these are our projections for what we're gonna do. I think, you know, one of the things that I'd like to see, and, and maybe it goes back to what Dimitri said, folks saying, I don't, I don't have anything to lose. Well, how much is the business, yeah. how much is the cost of downtime? Uh, how, Absolutely We need to convert you. these metrics yeah. into metrics that say, we spent this many mitigation, you know, this much time remediating uh, incidents, and that cost us this much productivity. Here's how we believe that we can save that cost with this investment in controls. Uh, I think that's the, the, the necessary next step in, in, this, in, in metrics. I absolutely agree. It's almost, it's almost embarrassing to go up in front of the board after the CFO's up there talking about, you know, income, balance, P&L, and then you have a Crayola chart because you're the security person, right? You're like, yeah, we're amber trending green. What does that mean, <laughs> right? If you're sitting in front of the CEO and you're running a business, and I view the departments that I run as a business, where you've got millions of dollars of steady state, millions of dollars of project, and you're bringing out a Crayola chart, that, that's just not good enough, and that's on, that's on our industry, to your point, whether it's, um, I was mentioning earlier today that there's another organization that we've been working with, and what they do, granted this is not perfect, but it at least gives you a thumb in the air kind of measure, is they say, if a machine is down because it has to be re-imaged, on average it takes three to four hours, say, that person that's using the machine, or usually using the machine, is therefore not able to perform their job. So if we take all the employees in the company, and how many ever hours they're supposed to work in a year, and divide that by company revenue, that's how many dollars, again, imperfect, but that's how many dollars of company revenue we've lost because this person's machine needs to be re-imaged. Now, after you take that step, maybe you get a little more refined and say, matters more for salespeople or senior execs versus the fellow that's working on the cafeteria menu or whatever it is. Or maybe you find out that there's certain resources like your system administrators that may not be as high in the corporate hierarchy that you should really be worried about the sanity <laughs> of their machines and how quickly you get them reimaged. So we, oh, I need to do this. Um, you talked about information sharing. One of your myths was that information sharing is, uh, is a panacea. And in particular, when you debunked that myth, you talked about you seem to talk about information from the government. Um, to be. But there's a very vital amount of information sharing that goes on company to company, right? And I think that Omar was talking about that. Omar was talking about that when you talked about the need to be able to have a conversation that was not freighted with liability or other aspects. So there could be a free discussion both within the company and I assume outside the company mm -hmm. um, with other, with your fellow wizards, right? You'd, wanna, you'd want the crowdsource this a little bit with your fellow wizards about what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're doing, and do it in a way that, that doesn't run afoul of, of any of the myriad problems that you have. Mm -hmm. 
what what are we what could we do to encourage that sort of information sharing that's lateral, right? That 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 will actually potentially improve the information flow among it. You know, you sit on a huge amount of information, um, and without and and this is not a dig, but you don't give it away for free, uh, right? Because if you did, I'm not a charity. Yeah, if you <laughs> if you did, then you would, would wouldn't be CrowdStrike anymore, right? So so. What can we yeah. do to what do, what do we do other than hiring you to get to get the value of your information? Well, that, that is a problem with information sharing. Information inherently has value, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't want to share it. So you're giving up some value when you share it, and there's no incentive today for getting something back. And that is why you see a lot of these information sharing organizations kind of start to break down and stop scaling. So when you look at FSI SAC, which was one of the original sharing organizations that was set up initially, very very successful, was set up, set up by the big banks. And then lots of other people started joining in, and then now it has 6,000 or something <laughs> members. And it stopped being effective in large parts because the big banks said, wait a second, we're sharing most of this information. We're not getting anything back from the tiny credit union out in Ohio that has no people and is just leeching off of us. So we're going to set up our own organization, which is now FSR, which is just the top 10 banks mm. and where everyone is participating and they know what they're getting. And they don't have the risk because that is the other problem with information sharing is you're going to tell a whole bunch of people about your breach and what happened to you, that may leak, that may impa impede um, your ability to respond to the breach effectively. It may end up um, on a front page of you know, Wall Street Journal. So there are inherent risks with sharing that people don't take into account. And the other reality of virtually every incident response investigation these days is that when there is an incident, the first call is not to me, is not to AIG, it's to your lawyers. Yes, to, to the lawyers. <laughs> yes, to get everything under privilege, and the first thing that lawyer is going to tell you is you are not to talk to anyone about this uh, without me being included because then you lose your privilege and in case someone gets sued, all those records become open. So you have a huge amount of impediments to information sharing. And that's not to say that there aren't um, areas where it does work and where you can anonymize it, but um, let's not underestimate how hard it actually is. And the reality is that at scale, it does not work because trust is not transitive. Mm -hmm. Just because Omkar and I trust each other and he trusts you doesn't mean that I should trust you. And that's when you have all these societies where we start um, sharing together because we know each other. And then Omkar says, let's bring, bring Randy in. And suddenly, I don't know the people that are in this group and I'm not comfortable sharing. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. In fact. I find that through the official channels, the FSI SACs, you'll get a lot more information that'll be stale and will be non-specific versus the informal relationships we have. Maybe it's human nature, right? Where I may have a personal relationship with a peer of mine at another bank or in another country or in law enforcement, call them up, hey, you guys seen something like this? Yeah, they're going after that? Yeah, and that conversation is of more value than eight gigabytes of Styx taxi feeds, right? <laughs> because all the information that I find through the public forums, to Dimitri's point about trust not being transitive, is really pedestrian and old. By the time it comes through that forum, the IOC's changed. So uh, I, you both eloquently described the problem. I didn't hear any potential solutions. You're not That's up accurate. here just to, to <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a moaning session. Let's come up with some answers here. What, what that, that, go, that goes back to the myth. It's not a panacea because yeah. a lot of times it doesn't work. But, but it would be helpful, right? If, if you and I were, if I was in the same visit, business zone car and, and he was seeing something and we had similar systems and similar issues, I could benefit from knowing so, that he so was saying So one-on-one, it works. Uh, and what it if works I didn't great. know him? He's yeah. not going to talk to me. And you know about it, you know about it already, because you've seen it four times. But if I don't pay you, I don't know about it. Yep. And 40 million people lose their money. Yep. How so, do you feel about it then? So the grand equalizer in that scenario. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the grand equalizer You're gonna in that scenario. You're going to take my word back? <laughs> usually becomes law enforcement, right? So if there is a material threat, if there is going to be monetary loss, that's when you get the call from your local FBI field office. And it's because of the nature of the information. Um, I think one of the ways that we could do this, and maybe it's a project for one of these smart grad students out there, um, is to come up with a way that we can comply with the wishes of our lawyers 
that we can avoid bad PR, but still somehow share that information in a manner that's timely, meaningful, and relevant, versus us having to check with a lawyer every word we speak? You know, I, I think that at the end of the day, this will always be about relationships. And what everyone here in the room needs to do is leverage events like this and others that are out there to build those relationships. You know, there's a great program that FBI runs called InfraGuard, mm -hmm. um, where you can go to regular meetings, meet your local FBI agents, build relationships so that when you do need help, you're not calling a 1-800 number, you're calling someone you know, Call an and, you, and, <laughs> and you can negotiate under which circumstances they're gonna help you and how much they're gonna tell you, how much you're gonna tell them. And those things are invaluable, and that's where real information sharing I, I, I agree 100%. I'm not, I, don't, I don't pretend that there is a solution for this, this particular one. Mm. It's, it's ironic that you know, the, inter, the, the internet is devoid of trust, um, and, and the fighting back requires trust, right? It's, <laughs> and it's in some respects, so it's an interesting problem. Because since I think that you were trying to, were you trying to get a no, word in edgewise on, on that conversation? I agree with these guys. Um, I think it's still happening, just in smaller circles, hmm. um, just more swiftly and not as at a large scale as some of the larger organizations, as Dimitri mentioned. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Let's talk about education for a second. Hmm. Um, you know, frequently it's said that one of the things that's lacking here is, is education. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, I tend to agree as a uh, teaching very bright law students um, who are incredibly facile with their, with their uh, iPhone uh, or whatever <laughs> device they have, uh, their Android device, which has such a good user interface that they don't have to think about anything that happens once they, you know, press their finger on the responsive screen. Um, but how do we start education even younger, right? I mean, we're, 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 we're well into the period where every child is a, digi is, 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 a, is a digital elite compared to their parents. How do we, what, what do we need to do to start educating uh, folks all throughout the, the ecosystem here in order to make this, in order to make the world a better place? Or would it make any difference? I, would it would it make a would it, you know would it make a would of difference to any in, in cybersecurity if we had a better educated populace? Uh, Randy, I would something a CEO said following last summer's attacks really struck a chord with me. Um, you know, he said I, I had no frame of reference for this for this incident for the impact of it, and this was a, a large corporation, uh, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> And, and they said, you know, I had, no, I had no frame of reference. I didn't think this was possible. And while I, I, I don't fault, that, uh, fault him, but it, to me, we can't wait. Well, we're not going to wait to start cyber early. And, and in 50 years, the next CISO will, will have that knowledge. That's not, that's not how it works. We need to, to, me, to me, it seems like we need to do more now to have people better understand this risk. And something Dimitri said earlier, he said, you know, when, when you talk to a company and they say, I'm, I'm not a target, well, you are a target. You have, e even if you put a lot of money into that IT system, another person can use those free cycles and that free power. Um, data that you might not think could be uh, monetized probably can be monetized. So everyone needs to understand their environment, know what normal looks like, and know, know what, the, what the business impact would be. And I think if they start asking more of those questions, you say, well, how important, you know, what, what would it look like if we didn't have that system? Well, it'd be hard to run a business. I think that will uh, spur more, um, more awareness and more knowledge. It, it seems like there's awareness now. I know cyber's a problem, but there's not really conscious acceptance of it, knowing how my business would be impacted, understanding my business. That's what I see. I'm curious with the rest of the panel. Well, obviously, the insurance guy got it wrong. Um, but, but in all seriousness, I, I, I don't think it's an either or, right? So I volunteer at my kid's school. I, you know, when I'm not fighting bad guys, I, I'm a dad. <laughs> and my contribution isn't that I can make lemon squares, because I can't. My wife can really well, if you can't tell. But <laughs> my contribution is ensuring that the way the school board operates and look, some of this comes back to a point that you were making about the economics of compensation, if I can say so, right? Public school teachers aren't, at this point, going to be the most cyber savvy people. The IT department in my kid's 
region that's responsible for the IT of all the stuff that they do at school aren't going to be the Dimitris of the world. So that's my opportunity to help educate. But it's also my opportunity to help make my kids and their peers, and my kids are seven and nine, right? Cyber native. So when my kids are on their Android tab, they know they have a disposable email address. They know what to do, what not to do, and it's okay to come to us if they have questions. But I've also instilled within them something that, if you read the papers these days, maybe wasn't so apparent to everyone, that if you can't draw a direct correlation between how you're receiving a service and how you're compensating the firm that you're using that service, it, it probably means you're the product, right? <laughs> I mean, Facebook's not free, right? We all get that? Gmail's not free, we all get that? I want to make sure that my kids understand that, and I want to make sure that their peers understand that. And when their teacher says, hey, sign up for this free service to remind you of when your child's homework is due, that they think twice before doing that. And I think that's on all of us to help. Because look, we're, we're the experts in this room, right? We need to help make sure that society levels up that way, and it's not going to happen by accident. So, so those are excellent, what I would term to be privacy type protections. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question runs more to um, cyber security mm -hmm. type of questions. You were, you were very, I think, very correct in pointing out that privacy and cybersecurity are two separate things. Um, obviously very closely reoriented, and this is not to denigrate privacy in the slightest. Um, um, but, you know, privacy seems to be more of a, you know, we can have a debate about what's good privacy, what information's available, what information's not available. Cybersecurity seems to me to be more binary, right? Either you have good, either it's good or it's bad, and, and you know, good or bad things happen, right? Um, less of a debate. We can talk about the economics of it and yep. whether things are worth, uh, whether a particular action is worth it or not. Uh, but that's a much more, hopefully, mathematical thing. Is there room for what I would term to be more cybersecurity type education? Is that part of, of what the mayor's initiative is? There's an education part of it? I, I understood that there was going to be more discussion with, with the citizens of New York about cybersecurity and an ongoing dialogue. What, what sort of information is, is sort of, you know, what's the thinking behind that sort of outreach to the populace? What are we trying to tell them? I think there's like, it's a two-pronged approach because you have like your general awareness for just making people more cyber aware uh, so they know when they come across certain things, okay, this might be related to that. Um, but then there's also kind of grooming the next cyber security analysts or engineers, et cetera. Um, and that also starts at a younger age as well. Like now you see like all these smaller programs that are coming on the map um, with trying to and still in our youth at an early age, like, okay, this is something that I can aspire to. Um, I think we need more of those. I think we need more of those online where, you know, people in different countries can work on these initiatives, you know, where, whether they're, you know, cyber ranges, et cetera, so where they can kind of get the theoretical education, but then also start to play and know how to operate in this type of environment, um, regardless of whether it's business focused or not. So all three of you are cyber hirers in that sense, right? Are you all, are you all finding a dearth of, 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 of qualified folks? I mean, are the, all, these, all these students are going to have jobs when they get out of school? Is that because there's, there's, there's th that much demand? Is that, is, that a, is that a myth or is that the fact? I think all of us are hiring, so <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, you know, I think this is a pretty I hope good you all have your resumes ready to go. They're all hiring. You heard it here. Okay, so that, and do you think that, I mean, we have a, with, you know, uh, Professor Memons here, he would talk about the Cyber Fellows Program that we've initiated in order to, to uh, have more graduates, and you, you went to Georgia Tech, which has a very renowned sort of uh, 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 cybersecurity program, so are, are there enough places like this? What do we need to do to spur um, exactly what Kessens was saying? How do we, are there actions that, that the government needs to take? What do we need to do to spur more cyber warriors that, you know, well, on our, on, on, or get on, it out yeah. there to I guess communities that are less exposed to this because that's an issue as well right in these underserved areas where maybe your mom or your dad is not an engineer or not anywhere closely related to this field how are they getting into these programs as well 
And I also think that we should start earlier than college. I think this Absolutely. needs to be in high school. Um, and people need to learn, I actually think, both sides, defense and offense. Uh, you know, that can be a little dangerous, but um, um, I always think that you know, the best defenders I've ever met are those that have done offense mm -hmm. because they understand how it works, they understand the capabilities and limitations, and that makes them much better defenders. I know you guys have hired a lot of people that have come out of the government that have done that type of work, and um, I think um, that talent has been invaluable to New York Cyber Command. Absolutely. So do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one back there. most valuable on what aspect? Uh, like what data do you think affect the most or like what resources are the most critical? Uh, like where do you think you focus most on the cyber? Oh, that's a great question. I think that's two different things, right? The cybersecurity yeah, versus privacy thing. Can you repeat which question you're going to an yeah, answer so that sure, folks so online can hear? Sure, so from the question of what's most valuable to New York City, um, and I believe you asked how do we decide to protect that, or what do we plan to do? What initiatives are in place? Um, so again, so from New York City Cyber Command's main mission, prevent, detect, respond. Uh, so any data, no matter you know how valuable it is, it's in, within our realm to look to protect that data. Uh, what do we have to do to put us, ourselves in the best position? Maybe that's you know, pushing all of the proper controls, whether it's technology or policies, um, to be able to defend the city um, from the aspect of trying to determine like how our data will be categorized, et cetera. That's also a cybersecurity policy level. Um, but then also I believe, um, and I might be wrong, uh, but the, the mayor's office of operations, I believe also has hired a, a chief privacy officer. Uh, so I think this is the first for New York City. Um, so I know a, a lot of work will come out of that. Uh, with regards to the privacy area, but that's not particularly in my domain. If I could answer that from the private sector as well, I mean, we, again, if you think about that, you know, we don't have infinite money, therefore we need to decide where to spend judiciously. Um, we look at it through two vectors, right? Data classification, so where's your most sensitive asset and how do you secure that? But then we also partner with our friends in uh, business continuity because most Private sector organizations have a business continuity plan that tells you where your crown jewels are and therefore which systems are most critical. So you focus on those first. So when we think about something like patch management, it isn't you know blindly roll patches out across the enterprise. Target your core assets and work your way back to the least important ones. But at the same time, your critical assets are also usually the ones that don't get patched. So it's always one of these things where that is great in theory, well, but don't always work <laughs> right in practice unless you push the needle to force that type of upgrade. Like, okay, let's look at this environment. Let's see how can we actually update this system to where it's you know still working with legacy applications, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, and get us to where we should be. So you raised the question of patch management, which is uh, an, an interesting one because it. It, it sort of steps past the question of um, why uh, you need so much patch management. Um, uh, you know, software is, in some respects, a best efforts sort of a product. Um, it comes out, and then there's patches um, routinely. Um, um, in almost all instances, the software manufacturer is not liable for anything that happens because you break that shrink wrap and uh, you've agreed to the, or to the terms. Yeah. Or hardware. <laughs> I was going to, so I was going to get to that question. What, what you know, is the, should there steps be taken to spread the responsibility for cybersecurity to more parts of the ecosystem? I mean, right now the software manufacturers, the hardware manufacturers are largely out of the game. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not. They're not responsible for 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 what happens. So, is there is that a fruitful area to to? Do you think there should be changes in that area? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges, at least from, from our side, and Dimitri, I'm not sure, as a software development shop, you probably have a view as well, right, is the concept of security as a bolt-on 
or after the fact can't continue anymore, right? This is a core part of your build and dev process. This needs to be as important to your developers as code quality is for other aspects. You have a set of standard libraries and a style guide and you know, all these other adornments when it comes to writing code. Well, you should be considering security in it as well. And there's a lot of companies, a lot of software development companies that have very rapid releases that integrate you know, this kind of, are you using a red flag function like string copy rather than string end copy? For those that aren't developers, that's one of the things that leads you to buffer overflows. Are you using dangerous code? Are you doing input validation properly? There's a reason the OWASP top 10 hasn't changed much over the last 10 years, right? Well, I think you know, any software developer manager with their salt will tell you that there are three factors you're solving for, features, time, and quality. And they'll tell you basically pick two out of three. <laughs> and um, you know, quality is often the one that gets uh, compromised because the realities of business intervene. And you, know, you can build the most secure software, but if you're out of business by the time you build it, who cares? And um, yeah, I think that that's the reality in a lot of situations. And also the fact of the matter is that there is no way that we know how at scale to build perfectly secure code. Um, I use Microsoft as an example. They've done a ton of things over the last um, 17 years now, um, since Bill Gates wrote that famous memo, um, focusing on showing up security of Windows. You look at where Windows 10 is today, Redstone 2, and where Windows XP was 17 years ago, it's night and day. And yet, every single month, there's a patch Tuesday with critical vulnerabilities that are being discovered. And the reality is, and this is part of the debate that we're having these days at a policy level about vulnerability disclosure where the people are arguing that governments and intelligence communities should not be stockpiling vulnerabilities, they should be releasing them to the world, and others are saying we don't want to disarm ourselves. And at the root of that debate is actually the fundamental question of are vulnerabilities finite or are they infinite? And of course at a practical level they're finite, but when we actually look at the history that we now have of decades of software improvements in the case of Windows and other areas where there was dedicated effort and continues to be dedicated effort, what we find is that even when we patch vulnerabilities, we introduce new ones. And there was a great example just this week when Microsoft uh, released a patch in January for the Meltdown Spectre vulnerabilities. And in doing so, actually introduced a more egregious it vulnerability was. when they did it. And you know, this is not a bash of Microsoft. It happens. It's software development. Bugs happen. That's what vulnerabilities fundamentally are, they're bugs. And we are in fact creating more vulnerabilities with every new line of code that we're introducing into the system. And I think we're not gonna patch ourselves way, uh, way out of this problem because they will always exist because we're always adding new capabilities. As, as an, I'm gonna probably get myself into trouble as the insurance guy <laughs> saying this. Uh, because we write insurance you know, commercial liability insurance for a lot of hardware and software developers. But I think there should be some liability, but to Dimitri's point, there will always be bugs in software. Software is written by humans, there's gonna be bugs. So the mere presence of a, of a bug shouldn't, shouldn't dictate liability. I, I think people need to, I mean, there's just no such thing as, as bug-free software. But I think it's the response. And I, I, I do think that there should be some uh, it's very hard to, to, to codify, and I'm not sure, how, you know, I don't have the answer to this problem, but there should be some guidelines, I don't know where, how we come to these, about do you have a, a you know, a, a, a vulnerability coordination program? You know, I mean, if, if y your software is going to have bugs, we all, we, we just agreed on that, do you have a place to intake that information when someone finds some and act on it in a responsible manner? I think that's what probably needs more work because it, it does seem a little bit unfair that, that companies are pushing out software, charging for it, but, the, but really have ultimately no liability. That seems to me like a misalignment of incentives, which is not the cause for this situation today, but it certainly exacerbates the situation. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to negligence. Are you doing something intentional that is making it less secure? And uh, IoT is a great example when you have all these devices that are coming out, they will have vulnerabilities and you have these companies, they're not thinking about the update process. When that patch needs to be, come out, 
do they actually have the ability to push that patch out? Or are they going to stop supporting that product the minute they ship it? Right? Those are the sorts of things where I think regulatory uh, frameworks can help in ensuring that best practices are implemented and um, that we're actually making these companies at least think about these issues um, once their product leaves the, the factory. Yeah, it's interesting that we're, again, talking about this over lunch. You know, before you can plug anything into the electric grid, into your house wiring, and if you intend on having homeowner's insurance, I'm sure the insurance people would advocate that everything be under, or everything be certified by underwriter's laboratory. There's no equivalent for the internet, right? You can go buy a router from Best Buy that'll mm -hmm. ironically have an underwriter's, underwriter's laboratory certificate for power. That thing burns down. <laughs> I gotcha. There you go. <laughs> Vulnerabilities. But, but absolutely no assurances to the quality of code or the lack of vulnerabilities or the agreement to release security errata for any particular amount of time. Okay, on that note, I think we have reached our time limit. I want to please, please thank the panel for, for their... <laughs> and thank you very much for being. I think, Professor, we, we are now going to hear from Professor Nasser Memon, who's going to tell us about something fascinating. Professor Memon. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I was supposed to give closing remarks, but it's kind of strange to do that when you, when you we did not witness something to give closing remarks for it. Uh, as you noticed, I just came in late. Uh, there was a, a press conference that the mayor held uh, in the afternoon that I had to go for. But I'd just like to take two minutes of your time to talk about an initiative that NYU Tandon has launched and we're very proud of. Uh, and it's called the NYU uh, the, uh, New York Cyber Fellowships Program. It's been launched in partnership with uh, the city, New York City Cyber Command. Uh, and essentially, the problem we're trying to address is what came up earlier. Randy talked about the shortage of cybersecurity professionals. The mayor announced that he wants to create 30,000 uh, 30, jobs in cybersecurity in, in the city. And the various estimates you hear that we need a million professionals, we need 100,000 professionals, whatever. I don't know what the right numbers are, but I know the numbers are large. Uh, and also I know that we really don't have uh, the capacity to, to actually supply these uh, numbers. Uh, at Poly, for at, at NYU Tandon, for example, we have been uh, running the Cyber Co program funded by the federal government where we give scholarships to students to specialize in security. It's done by 10, 20, 30 universities across the country now. Uh, how many graduates do we produce? Uh, barely a thousand a year, right? All the universities together. And how much money is spent on it? Tens of millions, closer to maybe 50 million uh, is spent by the government to produce these, uh, say, uh, roughly a thousand cybersecurity experts. So how do we produce these million, uh, hundred thousand, et cetera? And we, I think we, we are trying to answer that problem uh, using the Cyber Fellows Program. So first question is, where, where is the talent? Where do, where do we find them? Uh, we believe that there are a large number of underemployed or unemployed millennials who are looking to transition into technology, uh, but they're not able to do so. Uh, re a recent McKinsey study said that 51% of the millennials are either un underemployed or, or, or unemployed. And so NYU Tandon, about two years back, started a pathways program to transition STEM, non-STEM uh, students to uh, degrees, uh, uh, careers in computer science and, and cybersecurity. And there are a large number of them. There are about twice the number of psychology graduates produced by this country as compared to computer science graduates. There are as many people who graduate with a degree in, uh, as for being a park ranger as who graduate uh, with a degree for being uh, a computer scientist. So th there's a large amount of talent out there, very bright students, who are eager to transition. And so, so we need to provide them a way to transition. The second thing we need to provide them is affordability. Higher education has, became, has become uh, extremely unaffordable, as many of you know. Uh, and in that context, NYU, the Cyber Fellows Program, would be essentially awarding a master's degree, an online master's degree, or providing an online master's degree to students just for $15,000. That is it, the entire master's degree. 
uh, it would be the lowest cost such master's degree in the country, right? Uh, but it's not just about cost, it's also, also about quality. We believe that using technology, using online uh, delivery mechanism, you can actually scale up and at the same time achieve quality. Uh, and so, and, and one way to do that is, is by partnering with uh, uh, industry. So the program has been uh, launched in partnership with companies like Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley and Facebook and IBM and I can go on and on. We have a dozen partners who've jumped in saying we will help you shape the curriculum. We will participate in, in sort of uh, in so the growth of this, of this program. Uh, so it's, it would be, it's a program based on what I call industry-informed curriculum. And the third principle that Cyber Fellows is based on is the fact that cybersecurity is a contact sport. You can't sit in a classroom and talk about it, right? It's something that you have to engage in. You, you, and, and it needs these experiences built in. And so the New York City has the, the, the CISO has generously offered to uh, provide access to the New York City Cyber Range to the Cyber Fellow students, uh, as well as all the partner companies have uh, expressed willingness to design practical experiences using uh, the virtual lab mechanisms that we have uh, that, will, that will make these students like special, that they would, they would be uh, sort of equipped to uh, do the job right from the day they graduate. Uh, uh, because the, the curriculum has been designed in partnership with the industry. So I'll stop at that, I, I, I can keep going on and on, but with, with the plea that we would love to partner with you, uh, we, we would like to solve this challenge, we would like to create a program that creates, that, that uh, graduates, uh, uh, that is affordable and that can, that graduates very high quality cybersecurity professionals and we cannot do this without your help. If you're a student, think about signing up for it uh, or tell your friend about it. If you're a corporation, then come and talk to us. We want to work with you because we know that this cannot be done in isolation by, by academia. It has to be done in partnership with industry. Thank you. So there is a mixer what? at 5.30. Hmm? For the alumni, uh, okay, and and the next AIG lecture would be announced soon. Is that what you want me to say? Okay.